Hello, and welcome to PubK's 2023 Government Contracts Annual Review. We're thrilled that almost 4,000 registrants have joined, are joining us for this program. So far through this day three, we've already held seven different sessions, with two more this afternoon to follow this session. We hope that you'll be able to join us for most, if not all, of the remaining sessions. But a separate registration is required for each session that you want to attend which you can still do on the PubK site. My name is Alan Schwatkin. I'm the president of the PubK group and a partner in the law firm Nichols Lou. I'll be your host, facilitator, and moderator for this year's annual review. The PubK group publishes four newsletters, PubK Law, PubK Compliance, PubK Cyber, and our newest launched in mid-2022, PubK M&A. Many of you are already subscribers to one or more of these publications and we very much appreciate your support. Some of you joining this annual review are not yet subscribers, but I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. Information is at the website shown on the slide or is available from any of the contact you have at the PubK group. This conference would not have been possible without the strong support of our event sponsors, all of whom are listed on the next two slides. I encourage you to look at the skills and capabilities these firms have and engage them accordingly. Also new in 2022, PubK joined with Arnold and Porter to launch a periodic podcast called Bonafide Needs, covering emerging issues and interesting interviews. We'll continue that in 2023 as well and encourage you to access them through our website. If you're interested in partnering with PubK on a podcast, we'd be pleased to discuss this opportunity with you. In lieu of speaker gifts and in honor of our sponsors, PubK is making a contribution to the Capital Area Food Bank. With the food crisis facing our communities, I hope you'll consider making an individual or an organizational contribution. Since this entire program is being held virtually, all attendees will be in a listen-only mode. Your video will remain disabled throughout the session. But we welcome your questions. Use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll be monitoring that Q&A box However, with so many attendees, it won't be possible to answer all of the questions in real time. We're capturing your questions and we'll endeavor to answer as many as possible after the conclusion of the annual review. All presentation slides for this session are now available on the website and all presentation slides along with the audio will be available for download from the PubK site, probably within a week or so of the conclusion of the full annual review. We'll send an email to registrants when this information is available for download, how to access it, and for how long the material will be available. We're also applying for continuing legal education approval in Virginia, California, Texas, Florida, Colorado, and Kansas. We've already received approval for Florida, but we can't guarantee approval in the other jurisdictions, yet we expect that acceptance within the next few weeks. Again, we'll notify all attendees who've requested CLE approval when those approvals have been received. Finally, if you're interested in obtaining CLE, please look for our poll question during this presentation. The state boards require us to verify your participation during the event. We'll keep track of responses to verify that you viewed the panel. If you don't wish to obtain CLE credit, you can disregard the poll or just answer for fun. Now I'm thrilled to continue this eighth PubK annual review with our session eight panel on construction contracting. Our distinguished panel members are uh, Susan Ebner from Stinson, Dan Ramish from Smith Pactor, and Jim Van Horn from Southland Holdings. Susan, over to you. Thanks, Alan. Thanks very much. And thanks to PubK for inviting us to speak today. We're gonna hit three topics uh, to cover a very big area of construction law, what's happened in the statutes and regulations, case law roundup and practical considerations. Next slide, please. I'm gonna start off with talking about what's been going on in the statutes and regulations. Next slide. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act became law in 2021. It's anticipated to spend $1.2 trillion for transportation and infrastructure, and it's got a host of different projects that are covering it. They're covering public transit, passenger rail, bridges, water, resilience, internet, and clean energy. Next slide. Uh, there's a top 10 list that the White House has identified, including weatherization, wildlife, 
flood mitigation, brownfields, batteries, safe streets, transit, and cybersecurity. But so what's going on since they passed this? Well, they pushed out $185 billion in year one, and they're set to spend 80% of the funding through states and local governments in years two and following. They already, if you went to the SAM.gov website today, you would see there are at least 33 projects that are out for request for information or comment. Uh, they've issued executive orders and they've issued a Justice 40 directive where they're trying to also address equity and inclusion in the concept of who do they fund, what projects, and who gets to do the projects. Uh, we'll hear more about the White House Data Decisions websites that they've created, as well as the guidebooks. Next slide. Jim will talk about that in a few minutes. So what does this Infrastructure Act actually do if you're a construction contractor? First, it has domestic preference rules in it that require that in order to increase uh, domestic supply chain and manufacturing, that you use domestic products uh, without a waiver. We'll talk about that in a minute. All iron and steel to be produced in the United States and used in the infrastructure projects has to meet these requirements. All manufactured products have to also be produced in the United States and all construction material as well. And the executive order 14005 uh, set the stage for what's gonna be required and OMB has since issued memoranda on the topic. Next slide. Susan, and if I can jump in real quick. Uh, sure. On the domestic preference requirements in the BABA Act, uh, my colleague and I wrote a briefing paper about this in August. Uh, it's particularly significant because of the expansion of domestic preferences to federal assistance agreements. There have long been domestic preferences for DOT grant projects, the so-called Buy America Acts, and uh, some targeted other agency programs like EPA has some. But the BABA Act is comprehensive, and it's covers irrespective of the agency or the funding. Uh, this is in contrast to the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, uh, which was specific to projects funded by ARA. All grants and cooperative agreements uh, and projects funded by those, federally funded agreements, uh, will uh, be subject to the domestic preference requirements. And even for DOT programs, which would be covered under uh, the Buy America Act, uh, the coverage is broader uh, under Buy America, uh, the, the BABA, uh, than it was under the uh, prior uh, law. Uh, and there are complexities in, in figuring out uh, what rules will apply to federal grant programs uh, under the, the BABA, partly because of the interaction with the Trade Agreements Act. Uh, the WTO GPA uh, doesn't cover state and local procurements uh, except by option. And some of the states have opted in and others have not. And uh, so that, that can be complicated. The, uh, another complication in terms of the level of coverage under assistance pr agreement projects uh, is that prior laws, including the Buy America Act, to the extent that they are uh, broader and more restrictive uh, than the BABA Act, uh, still apply. So you really have to go case by case and look at uh, what rules apply to under grant pro uh, programs under the BABA Act. Yeah, Dan, thanks. Those are good points. I would say BABA, Buy America, Buy American covers pretty much every Buy American domestic preference type of act that there is. The Trade Agreements Act, Buy American Act, Specialty Metals Act, you name it, it covers it. Um, just like ARA, we've got this issue that is percolating as to if you've got a state and local federal assistance or a cooperative agreement or even grant, what is going to happen in terms of what's going to be compliant once you hit those WTO GPA thresholds because they all accept different things. The OMB guidance that's on this page right now, M2211, actually tries to define this. And in a way, I think it doesn't really track exactly what's in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. It creates a different standard, but uh, you know they're interpreting how this is going to be. And we'll talk about that. So the first thing it looks at is it covers programs that started in May of 2022. And you look at it first, does it cover infrastructure? Does it use Infrastructure Act uh, funds in whole or in part? Even a dollar could trigger the requirements under the BABA if you're using infrastructure funds. Is the agency ready to apply domestic preference requirements? This is actually very interesting because it actually is looking at in other words, if the agency cannot address these domestic preference requirements, 
will a waiver be needed? And that will trigger some of the requirements that are under the OMB and the executive order, which is to create this Made in America office, which then takes all waivers, has to post them, give an opportunity for folks to respond. Um, you also have to maintain certification. So if you are getting any of these infrastructure funds, be sure that you really are tracking exactly what money has been spent on what, because we can expect that there are gonna be a lot of audits on this and uh, follow up if needed. Uh, so what's infrastructure? I mean, infrastructure pretty, very broadly, as OMB says in the memo, please broadly construe this. And if you have any questions, contact OMB as to whether or not you think it's gonna be applied. The OMB guidance also said, we're gonna give you some definitions, which we'll talk about in a minute. And the, these are the current ones that are in effect. Next slide. Uh, so Baba, what is a manufactured product? This actually is under the Infrastructure Act. It says those products that are the cost of components, mine produced, manufactured in the US that are greater than 55% of the total cost, very much like the Buy American, but as we'll talk about, the Buy American Act regulation has changed. So this second sentence, unless another standard for determining minimum domestic content has been established. The executive order, when it was seeking to address infrastructure types of things said, I want you to consider looking at value. They have not changed the standard to a value one. There's a lot of questions about whether and how you would do that, but they have, we have got the FAR and the FAR does cover this. So this may be the other applicable law or regulation when we're talking about federal procurements. Construction material as well, all manufactured and processed in the United States. Go to the next slide, please. I'm trying to go very quickly and I apologize, but there's a whole lot to cover and we've got a lot of folks here to go and talk about it. Construction material, another divergence, uh, if you will, from Buy America. Construction material covers uh, granular things like iron, steel, cement, cementitious materials, et cetera. Interestingly, construction material, if you had glass and you had lumber, you put it together and you made a window, it's no longer construction material. It's going to be defined and considered under the definition for manufacture. Uh, they've now under the OMB guidance said, what is manufacture? We're going to look at the last step, the final step, and the immediately preceding step and, and look at those qu quantities of do I have 55% or more, depending upon what the FAR says. Next slide. Um, the Buy American Preference, as I said, applies to articles, materials, and supplies, those that are permanently affixed or incorporated or used in the process. Things like desks, computer equipment, furnishing, uh, tools brought to the site, scaffolding, none of that is going to be considered uh, something that's going to be subject to the Buy America Preference, only those things that are actually going into the project. Next slide. Uh, in addition, we talk about the waiver. There are three types. They look very familiar, uh, non-availability, unreasonable cost, and public interest. However, they are slightly different. The non-availability uh, unit is one where they're really looking for the agencies to be very limited in how they give non-availability. So they're looking at things that are targeted potentially based on, on the scope, based on a particular procurement, based on a time or duration, so you may actually actually see contracts or grants that say you're going to have this waiver, but only for so long. Uh, unreasonable cost, again, you know, that's what the price is. There is a, an exception uh, for minor de minimis things that are 5% of a project cost up to a million. Um, also, small grants and minor components are also going to be potentially accepted under this waiver. Waiver requests, as I said, go through the Made in America office. Uh, they've created a posting requirement, and that posting requirement was supposed to be on a centralized website. It's now like if you go to that website, the miao.gov website, you'll then be referred to the individual agencies. Uh, so you'll have to do a little bit of looking as well to see what these waiver requests are. Uh, next slide. The FAR rule, which is by American, went into effect in October of 22. So to the extent that the FAR rule is going to apply, you're going to see a different standard than we see under the Infrastructure Act. Uh, that started with 60%. Uh, starting in calendar year 24, it's going to be 65%. So instead of the 55% uh, of the cost of components, it, the standard is now 60 or 65% 
uh, going up to 75% in 29. What's really important here is there are some options for alternatives. So you have to really look at the specific uh, procurement or grant or cooperative agreement, whatever is going to apply this rule, because uh, you're going to see a possibility that it could say, we're going to apply 60 in year one, 65 in year two, and 75 in year three, if you've got a contract that's going to go over multiple years. Uh, alternatively, you can have a contracting officer say, no, we're going to use the 60% for all four years of the contract. Um, they also could, if they cannot get products that will meet the 60% requirement, have a fallback threshold for a period of time until 2030 for products and materials that are not COTS and not steel. Next slide. Uh, another piece of the Infrastructure Act is the Davis-Bacon Act and related acts, and that calls for payment of prevailing wages and fringe. Now, you're probably familiar with it because everybody who's in construction, for example, you'll get a list of the Davis-Bacon Act rates if you are subject to that requirement. Uh, there's a DOL fact sheet on exactly how this is going to work. It covers new and existing awards, but not broadband. You are also required to certify payrolls and watch for your subcontractors for certifying their payrolls um, and doing some monitoring for compliance. There is a Department of Labor notice uh, for proposed rulemaking. As I said here, there's over 40,000 comments that were submitted. Uh, my check last night indicates they still have not issued that final rule. So stay tuned because that will happen. Next slide. So how has rollout been going? In some ways, it's been very quick because they passed the legislation, they started with creating these websites, et cetera. On other ways, it's been slow, only 185 million out the first year. Uh, and we're seeing waivers that are coming in. You'll see a lot of different waivers and they're not giving a whole lot of time. So Department of Transportation, for example, took advantage of that domestic waiver preference for certain assistance agreements below that million dollar threshold. They only gave a five day notice and comment period. Uh, GAO has been looking at some of these requirements the way they're rolling out and has basically said, look, you got to comply with the Administrative Procedures Act when you're talking about rolling out some of these policies that are going to regulate a community and have a significant impact on rights and obligations of parties. Uh, so stay tuned on that. Next slide. Uh, in addition, and just very briefly, Inflation Reduction Act, uh, that's an, a companion piece, uh, more infrastructure type of projects in the environmental and energy and climate change area, uh, again, with prevailing wages, add into that, there's a apprentice program for violence so that if you want to get credits, these tax credits and bonuses, you have to meet both prevailing wages and or apprenticeship program requirements. That's already started. Uh, there are big sticks if you don't meet some of these requirements. Next slide. In addition, there's a FAR case on the greenhouse gas. I won't say a lot more. The slides are here, except that what is different here is they are not only putting in place requirements for uh, disclosing that are now going to be reportable as part of your SAM registration, but they're also, if you're a covered contractor, a major contractor, you'll have to do a lot more in terms of science-based targets, et cetera. Uh, other rulemakings at different agencies are also bringing up the greenhouse gas emissions, and so stay tuned for those because those are also in the process, and uh, they may very well require a lot more of greenhouse gas emissions. I think there are a lot of uh, concerns, particularly about the impact on small businesses of this rule. Uh, large businesses, uh, the coverage will uh, potentially coincide with the SEC rules. Uh, and so there's some concern in the final rule, making sure that those rules are aligned. Yes, I would agree with that. Next slide, please. Uh, National Authorization Act as part of the omnibus package that was passed at the end of December. We have a number of different provisions that are out there. Some of them are familiar, some of them are new. Uh, you've seen in the past where they add unilaterally new clauses into contracts. Well, now Section 805 says treat those as uh, potentially entitled to request for equitable relief. So that's a possibility. Foreign made unmanned drones, those have prohibitions based on Chinese made products for certain manufacturers. Uh, the same forced labor uh, from the Uyghur province in China, there are restrictions on acquisition for that. And there are also restrictions on the Chinese procurement of military dual use technology, uh, requirements for disclosure. 
Uh, the, old, the Section 889, which started a couple of years ago, which in, involved video surveillance and telecommunications products, that same type of restriction is now going to be extended to Chinese semiconductors over the next five years. Hasn't happened yet, but stay tuned because semiconductors are everywhere. Uh, other reporting requirements as well for Chinese. So the theme here is more reporting and more care has to be taken with the supply chain. Next slide. So one of the questions, this slide just covers some questions, which Jim is going to pick up on and, and Dan is going to pick on as well, which is given how extraordinary these things are that are going to be happening, the vast amount of contracts and things, is there going to be enough labor and products and materials to do the job? And what's going to be the impact of inflation and some of these other tensions out there on there? So we'll go to the next slide and um, move on to COVID relief. Just very briefly, lots of COVID relief out there. How has it hit construction? Next slide. Uh, there have been guidance and materials from the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense, et cetera. And there are a whole host of cases that are covering this. The bottom line on this is the cases don't give you relief if you just say, oh, it was COVID. But just like any other change, you're going to have to really prove it and state a cause of action and watch out, by the way, for uh, sovereign acts, which Dan is going to talk about in the uh, cases section. Next slide. Thanks, Susan. Uh, real quick. Uh, oh, and I, I think uh, I'm going to, we're moving to my slides. Uh, on the, the COVID relief cases, uh, I just wanted to underscore and second that about uh, not being able to made, wave a made magic wand. Uh, we kind of knew early on uh, in the pandemic that uh, it was going to be difficult for contractors to get price adjustments due to COVID. Uh, there was that uh, Pernick Circa uh, case out of the CBCA dealing with uh, Ebola, and the contractor couldn't get any relief. And then last year on this panel, we talked about the Orsa Technologies nitrile glove situation, uh, which which really showed that uh, you know pointing to COVID is not a panacea. Uh, you have to be able to show that the effects uh, were unforeseeable. Uh, and a lot of times contractors knew what they were getting into. Uh, so uh, thanks for, for highlighting that. Okay, next slide. Did you so, want to talk about this? Go ahead. Yes, uh, th thanks, Susan. Uh, Section 822 of the 2023 NDAA, Susan highlighted some of the other provisions of the NDAA, uh, but this will be a big deal for uh, contractors. Uh, including uh, construction contractors, inflation relief for defense contractors. Uh, there, it's new uh, DOD authority to provide inflation relief without consideration on fixed price contracts. And it, it's a temporary authority for DOD to provide extraordinary contractual relief to contractors and also subcontractors uh, when due solely to economic inflation, prime contractor or subcontractors costs are greater than the contract price. It also increases uh, approval thresholds uh, and uh, subject to implementation, it authorizes uh, relief that's different in kind from relief referenced in the DOD DPC memos uh, earlier in the year. Uh, the authority is discretionary, not mandatory, and it's scheduled to expire uh, December 31st of 2023. Uh, it also requires specific funding, and Congress has not yet appropriated money for the relief. Next slide, please. So the, this is uh, this is the real deal. Uh, back in May and September, the DoD DPC issued memos uh, that essentially told contractors uh, that they were out of luck on fixed price contracts or had very limited avenues for relief. So the original memo back in May said there was no authority for providing contractual relief for unanticipated inflation under fixed price contracts, absent a specific clause like an EPA clause. And then the September memo, follow-up memo by DOD, uh, managing the effects of inflation with existing contracts was a little bit more accommodating, uh, you know, mentioning accommodation, uh, perhaps to address acute impacts on small businesses and other suppliers, uh, mentioning schedule relief or otherwise amending contractual requirements, but there was a specific requirement for ad adequate consideration obtained for the government. Uh, and uh, the the only relief they offered without consideration was the traditional relief uh, available under Public Law 85804 Authority, uh, Part 50 uh, of the FAR. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the this uh, table just highlights uh, that the authority under Section 822 is 
new and different from the public law 85804 authority, which was limited to situ situations where uh, losses on a contract would impair the productive ability of a contractor. And generally, it also required a showing that uh, the continued operation was essential to the national defense, and relief could only be to the extent necessary to avoid impairment of the contractor's productive ability. Whereas this new authority, it does require uh, the cost to be greater than the price, and it only gives relief for uh, effects due solely to economic inflation. Uh, but it's true uh, amendment uh, without consideration uh, and it's not constrained by national defense uh, interests uh, or impairing the productive ability of the contractor, just a loss on the contract. So it's a much more, uh, much broader uh, avenue for relief. We are waiting on funding. There are uh, also uh, other limitations to be aware of. It only applies to DOD and doesn't cover uh, civilian agencies. Uh, and, you know, it may be tricky to show that the uh, impacts, uh, cost overages are due solely to economic inflation rather than other effects that are going on right now, such as the stuff that Jim's going to talk more about, uh, labor market and supply chain disruptions. Uh, the, the other thing is, of course, we are waiting on the money, and so uh, a lot will hinge on implementation. Next slide, please. Uh, and we, we're not going to speak to these, but I just wanted to flag for construction contractors uh, significant developments uh, in terms of wage rates. Uh, there is a separate panel uh, that PubK had a, an excellent panel with Michael Schreier, uh, Hush Blackwell, uh, covered, uh, I think, 25 minutes on, on, on these issues. So we won't uh, uh, mention them uh, more than to, to refer you to the labor and employment panel. Next slide, please. Now we'll uh, talk a little bit more about uh, some of the case law. Next slide. So Wright Tool Company uh, and Supply Corps uh, address some of the uh, current uh, issues that are coming up in the current environment that are um, you know, broadly uh, uh, issues that uh, contractors experience all the time, but uh, kind of giving a sense of uh, of how they're coming up with the current supply chain issues. So Wright Tool Company is a, a bid protest where the agency rejected contractor alternative delivery schedule. It was accounting for potential supply chain disruptions. Uh, the contract required a 90-day delivery, or the solicitation did, and uh, Wright Tool Company said they would like to propose 150-day delivery on the first delivery order to account for supply chain disruptions. Uh, they said, we do not see issues with any particular item in the tool load. We have had many unexpected shortages due to the global pandemic environment. We would caution that unexpected delays are commonplace. We will still strive to meet the 90-day delivery, uh, but adding 60 days is a responsible decision in the current environment. And GAO uh, agreed with the agency that they were uh, right to reject the uh, right tool companies. Uh, alternative delivery schedule and that that right tool company had not accepted that mandatory term uh, of the 90 day delivery schedule. Uh, Supply Corps, uh, the board dismissed a contractor time extension claim. Uh, in that case, uh, the dismissal was based on uh, the absence of uh, contracting officer uh, final decision. But the uh, Armed Services Board said that in any event, a pricing agreement between a prime and a sub, which are coming up more frequently in the current environment uh, because of uh, disruptions and in inflation uh, does not generally excuse the prime's failure to deliver on time. Next slide, please. So uh, Susan mentioned earlier, uh, sovereign acts issues have, uh, have come up in, in the pandemic. Uh, and this is uh, one example, Aptum Federal Services. There was a design build uh, construction contract at Arnold Air Force Base, the base commander closed the base for two months due to COVID, and Aptum submitted a claim for $99,000 in costs plus a 59-day extension. The Air Force granted the extension but denied the costs, citing sovereign acts. And uh, the uh, board here uh, looked over the elements of the sovereign acts defense. It has to be a governmental action that was public in general, and the act must render the performance of the contract impossible. Uh, and so they looked at the uh, base commander's uh, order that was closing all non-operationally urgent uh, personnel uh, access to the base until further notice. 
uh, and the contractor was deemed uh, not operationally urgent. Uh, and the board said the gov government had act acted as sovereign in, in issuing the order preventing access to the base. And the reason for the order was general and public, uh, genuinely motivated by uh, the pandemic uh, concerns and, and not targeting the contractor. And the, uh, the board also found that the order rendered performance impossible because the government couldn't provide access for the contractor to perform the work at the site without violating the law. Um, and so essentially in these sovereign acts cases, uh, the, you almost treat the government as having multiple personalities. It has its sovereign hat and its contracting party hat. And the sovereign act is almost seen as a, an intervening uh, third party uh, event that's going on. And uh, the, the government as contracting party isn't responsible for that. We can go to the next slide, please. Uh, Jay Dunn uh, was another uh, Sovereign Acts case. Uh, this was a design-build construction contract at Fort Drum, New York. Uh, another COVID restriction here. Uh, base commander uh, issued an order saying that base visitors traveling from more than 350 miles away were subject to a 14-day quarantine requirement. And uh, there was a different wrinkle in this case. Jay Dunn argued that a New York law with a three-day quarantine uh, you know, in instances where uh, they could show that personnel had a negative COVID test, uh, that option disproved that the uh, performance was impossible uh, under the uh, contractor's contract. But the government uh, prevailed in this case as well, proved a sovereign act. Uh, the quarantine applied to all visitors and wasn't targeted at the contractor, and Jay Dunn uh, the board held failed to establish that workers uh, would have tested negative uh, and that it wouldn't have suffered the same damages under New York's law. We can go to the next slide, please. So uh, a couple permitting cases uh, that highlight uh, the basic rule when it comes to permits on construction contracts, uh, that the contractor bears the risk of complying with state uh, contracts. So. Uh, in ACC Construction Company, uh, the there was an issue with uh, permitting uh, where the you know the board looked at uh, a permitting requirements that were imposed by the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality, and and said that the contract unequivocally assigned all risks of uh, complying with permitting requirements to the contractor, and. Uh, it states the, the rule that unless the government assumes the risk in unmistakable terms, uh, the government as contracting party won't be liable to, uh, you know, for third party determinations of another sovereign government. So in this case, Virginia DEQ gave the contractor a hard time on its permits. Uh, that was the contractor's risk to assume and the government uh, wasn't required to give any relief. And a similar uh, situation with JAAT technical services, the government required the contractor to obtain a second permit, but effectively the, the first permit uh, was invalidated because of a lack of certification for the engineer that was responsible. And so the, um, the local agency body that required a second permit uh, wasn't creating extra work. The contractor was required to maintain its permits throughout performance. Uh, and the government also didn't breach the covenant of good faith and fair dealing by not challenging the permit revocation because the contractor didn't ask for it and was even involved in a determination that there was no uh, basis to challenge the revocation of the original permit. Next slide, please. So another uh, issue that came up in a couple of cases this year was field office overhead. Uh, and field office overhead and the, the main point underscored by these cases, uh, you have to stick with either uh, handling field office overhead on a percentage basis, uh, treating field office overhead, overhead as an indirect cost, uh, or treating it as a direct cost and pricing it on a daily rate basis. You can't uh, switch between the two. Uh, so you can't, uh, during performance, price uh, field office overhead on a percentage basis and then switch to a daily rate basis. And both of these cases uh, underscored that. Uh, use of a percentage basis uh, in pricing uh, 
benefits the contractor somewhat if there are very limited government caused delays. But if there are extended delays, then a percentage basis rather than a direct basis uh, can really cause the contractor to uh, have to shoulder extensive costs that can't be recovered. Uh, so uh, something to be aware of during performance uh, and giving a hard look if you're considering treating uh, daily conditions or field office overhead as it, on a percentage basis. Next slide, please. Uh, Lodge Construction Company. Um, uh, this was a uh, False Claims Act uh, construction claim uh, scenario. So Lodge Construction uh, was performing um, a cofferdam project and submitted a variety of claims uh, to the government. And the government asserted counterclaims and fraud uh, at the Court of Federal Claims, seeking forfeiture damages, civil penalties, uh, under the anti-fraud provisions of the Contract Disputes Act, the False Claims Act, and the Special Plea and Fraud Statute. Next slide, please. So uh, just highlighting some of the facts in this case, uh, and the next slide will reveal that, that uh, the judge in this case found that uh, there was fraud uh, in a number of instances. So the total purchase price for dump trucks was $100,000. Uh, the the dump trucks. If we can go back, please. Uh, the the total price for uh, dump trucks that were actually uh, used by the contractor was one hundred thousand dollars. But they used rates that were associated with uh, trucks that had a combined value of more than three and a half million dollars. So more they used rates applicable to more recent trucks. And uh, the court found that Lodge knowingly used rates for newer equipment, citing recent repairs and rebuilding of the equipment, but didn't provide any evidence of the improvements, the repairs and the rebuilding. The court also found that personnel involved with the claims were intelligent and experienced and understood their methodologies would have the effect of inflating the claim and double counting. And at trial, there was a scheduling consultant that changed her story about out of period costs from what she had said in her deposition to conform with uh, the litigation position of the contractor. Uh, there was also a consultant that had helped to prepare the claims and issued a number of warnings that the methodologies the contractor was using would inflate uh, the claims and the contractor ignored the consultant. And there was also uh, a project manager who uh, the president of the company excluded from the final review of one aspect of the claim, a dewatering claim. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So the contractor, uh, the court held, knowingly and intentionally submitted a false claim by grossly exaggerating equipment, uh, operating a standby costs. The contractor, uh, the court held, had actual knowledge that the fair market value was far less than what was claimed. Uh, also intentionally used an inefficiency ratio, ratio that was inaccurate, fraudulently inflated uh, batch plant runtime and double counted costs also included uh, out of period costs and uh, the court uh, ordered the contractor to pay civil penalties and uh, forfeited forfeit its claims. Next slide. And just uh, a warning from the court uh, included in the decision uh, citing this case as a, a cautionary tale. So something, uh, this is a good decision to read if you uh, are working on construction claims and be aware of, uh, you have to be scrupulously uh, honest in your uh, approach to putting together claims. And uh, the uh, the court noted that uh, using, um, you know, if you're using uh, job cost data and record keeping data, if they're inaccurate, the claim uh, will inevitably, inevitably can contain errors, and the line between negligence and reckless disregard for the truth becomes vanishingly thin. Uh, so uh, words for contractors to be uh, aware of and, and live by, to be careful. Next slide, please. So uh, final thing in the case law section, uh, just a little update on the Department of Justice Procurement Collusion Strike Force. Uh, so this uh, body has been around since 2019. The PCSF has opened 60, more than 60 investigations uh, into antitrust in the public procurement space, uh, prosecuted more than uh, 
30 companies and executives, uh, also uh, earned 10 indictments and 10 guilty pleas uh, just in 2022. And a lot of that activity within public contracts has been specifically in public construction, especially at the state and local level. And it's very likely to ramp up further as the IIJA spending uh, kicks in. Next slide, please. Uh, these are just a, a few of the uh, decisions uh, from this year uh, in this area. Uh, USV Brubaker, uh, a conviction of an engineering company executive. Uh, Dornsbach, a Minnesota concrete company and CEO were indicted this year, uh, this past year. And then uh, contracts manager and a contractor employee pled guilty uh, on a former California Department of Transportation case. Next slide, please. Uh, and uh, just, I, I won't touch on them, but uh, we list on the last two slides uh, some uh, collusion red flags that government agencies have cited uh, to be aware of. And so when, you're, when you see potential red flags that the government will be looking out for, you should document uh, the business purpose uh, and and also uh, the benefit to the government and make sure that the collusion isn't actually taking place. Next slide. And next slide. All right, Jim, uh, I believe uh, you pick up from here. Hold on, I'm going to uh, just interrupt to uh, run our poll really quickly here uh, for CLE credit. Um, if you would like CLE credit, please answer yes to the poll. The poll will be up for two minutes. Thank you. And Jim, you can go ahead and pick up right here. Okay, great. Thanks, Craig. And uh, thanks, Dan and Susan. A great job covering these extensive requirements that, that follow all of these federal construction projects. I wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the practical considerations uh, in the construction industry for these uh, government contracts. Um, you know, focusing on where we're at right now with the IIJA, um, you know, and then talking a little bit about some of the practical resource, um, you know, labor resource strain and contractor capacity issues that that we may be seeing. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a, a graphic that I think I've used uh, for a year now, and it actually hasn't moved, at least that, uh, that uh, little progress bar on top uh, that, that uh, has a, a green bar. Um, you know, this just lays out, uh, this comes from the, the whitehouse.gov. It lays out uh, the, you know, the IIJA, how it moves from budgeting to you know, project completion. Um, if you look at the, the uh, material on, on the, uh, the website, it does say though that we are now, most programs are now in step three. So you know, step three is, you know, we've, we've gone from budgeting to planning and allocating, you know, which projects are gonna get funding. And now we're in this step three where we're starting to see projects be awarded uh, with IIJA money. Next slide, please. So to get us to this point, uh, in, in 2022, we saw several different uh, variations of playbooks uh, released by the White House. Uh, started out with you know, some more general um, guidebooks to help state, local, tribal, territorial governments uh, unlock the benefits from the IIJA. From there, we saw some more specific playbooks come out for rural, uh, state, local governments, uh, tribal playbook and then a more comprehensive technical assistance guide uh, that came out in uh, uh, May of 22. All of these apparently with the intent of getting uh, local state, uh, you know, tribal, territorial governments uh, educated and give them assistance in uh, being prepared for um, getting the benefit of IIJA money. Next slide, please. Uh, the White House even states that over 90% of the law's historic funding will be deployed by non-federal partners. So I think there's kind of a recognition here that the owners uh, that are going to be administering these uh, public contracts 
while they're going to have to uh, oversee a lot of what Dan and uh, Susan just walked through as far as all of the extensive requirements. Uh, many of the owners are likely not going to be the federal government itself and may not be overly familiar with uh, administering a federal government contract with all of the terms that we expect to be in these, uh, these awards and contracts. Um, next slide, please. So in uh, about halfway through the year in May of, of, of uh, uh, last year, two maps were, uh, were released on whitehouse.gov uh, website and they have been updated uh, pretty regularly and we've been kind of tracking them just to see um, you know, how the, the IIJA money is actually funneling and getting in position uh, you know, throughout the nation. Um, uh, last updates, as far as the raw data, uh, when these slides were being completed, the last update uh, came on uh, October 25th of 22, uh, cited 186 billion has been announced, was heading to the states with over 10,000 specific projects identified for funding. Next slide, please. So these are the maps that are updated. Again, this, this is the one, the last update. Um, from from October, so late last year. Uh, this just shows generally how the funding uh, made it to the states. So you could see uh, Texas, California, probably no surprise there. Um, you know, probably the the two biggest winners here with Texas with almost fourteen billion dollars, California over sixteen billion dollars. Um, you know, identified as um, beneficiaries of funding under the uh, IIJA. Next slide, please. And this is just a different variation of the map that pinpoints the, the various projects. Uh, probably no surprise that, uh, you know, the East and, and West Coast are, are very, uh, uh, very uh, heavily dotted here with, with uh, identified projects. Next slide. Uh, so then we talk a little bit, you know, from the practical standpoint of, so we know, um, you know where the construction industry was before COVID. We know that COVID hit. We know that that had a profound impact. And we know that that had a profound impact on the workforce. So uh, when COVID hit in 2021, you know, we had this event that is sometimes referred to as the Great Resignation, uh, where you know some some statistics show that over 47 million workers in all industries across the U.S. Uh, quit their jobs. And this has uh, more recently been recharacterized as the Great Reshuffle, because it's been noted that uh, hiring rates have actually outpaced quit rates since November of 22 uh, November of 2020. That comes from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, which would indicate that people are quitting, but they're also, uh, you know, taking different and new employment. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, again, labor force participation. This is all industries uh, showing that the labor force currently is missing about three million workers. Next slide. Specific to the construction industry, Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that last, uh, as of uh, December of 22, about 7.5 million uh, people uh, employed in the construction industry. That's up quarter over quarter. That's up from last year, about 160,000 jobs. Next slide, please. Uh, again, it says the same thing. A couple of different studies. I, I, I cited a uh, Associated Builders and Contractors uh, projected in 22 that there would be a 650,000 employee uh, workforce shortage in the construction industry alone. Next slide. Here's some graphics that show uh, anticipated you know, construction spending is is. Uh, is the, the green line, the top line, construction employment is the, the orange line below, which is not projected to keep up. Next slide, please. So, uh, you know, the, the J and the IIJA is, is, is uh, you know, represents the JOBS Act that, that, the, uh, that the legislation is intended to add jobs to the economy. It, it cites uh, that it will add, along with the Build Back framework, it will add about 1.5 million jobs per year for the next 10 years. And the, uh, the, the IIJA itself 
is intended to add about 700,000 new jobs a year, including 175,000 new jobs in construction alone. And that comes right out of whitehouse.gov uh, statistics. Next slide. Uh, so again, more statistics. Uh, there was an interesting uh, uh, McKinsey uh, article that came out that, that talked about this very issue about will labor crunch derail plans to upgrade U.S. infrastructure, and it kind of dissect this issue and looked at it in a couple of, uh, of closer lenses. Um, similar numbers. Uh, it's showing that uh, about you know close to half a million job openings. Uh, in the in the construction industry in in 22 um, that are that were unfilled and um, you know it points out that this this labor strain varies by geography sector and occupation so we know that there's an issue but we also know that a lot of additional money through the IIJA is about to flood the construction industry indicating that even more jobs are going to be needed next slide please and, and you know, th this is just a graphic. It's interesting. It, it, it pro uh, projects a peak uh, around 2027-28. Uh, it also projects that you know certain industries are going to peak earlier. One interesting um, you know, projection here is that the water industry is going to peak earlier than roads, highway, and bridges, and that's uh, noteworthy because you know a lot of the same type of labor and employees are needed. Um, which could mean that you know employees and labor that get tied up on water projects will, will lead to even more of a crunch for uh, road highways and bridges. Next slide, please. So uh, you know between the, the the articles that are out there and these topics that have come up before, I mean there's there's just this question mark around well how is this all going to be handled? Um, the McKinsey article cited a couple of possibilities. Uh, increase the supply of construction labor you know, that, that could be upskilling and reskilling the existing workforce, hiring workers for non-traditional segments. All of these things uh, are, are ways of potentially attracting employees. But I think the problem is, is that industry, industry-wide and, and nationwide, you know, you see such a deficit, like three million um, openings uh, in the labor market, and, and it's just not clear where the, you're going to track that labor force from. Um, number three and four are probably what are most interesting from a government contract perspective or any contract perspective, and that would be revisiting how owners work with contractors and suppliers and coordinating more effectively. Next slide, please. Uh, the other thing to point out is that, you know, we, we can look and focus on the numbers and the employees in the labor force, but the government contractors that are going to be available to do the work, uh, those, they are also limited. So, you know, you, you can look at employees a little bit separate from contractors that have the administration and have the management and have the back office support to comply with all of those extensive requirements that uh, Susan and Dan had gone through. Um, you know, there, there's only a finite number of those contractors, and with with you know most contractors in the industry, uh, you know, projecting uh, near near uh, record high backlog, it's just not clear where uh, you know all this work is gonna is gonna be completed and where all the contractors are gonna come from to complete the work. So it's something just uh, to consider, something we need to think about. Next slide. So you could expect to see in this in government contract space new startups, crossovers from commercial construction, possibly foreign investment. Um, you know wherever the shortfall is going to come from, it's likely going to come from uh, con you know contractors that have limited experience in government compliance. And you, you saw you know Dan covered the the procurement uh, collusion strike force and um, you know all of the efforts that are going to be on regulating and make sure that the uh, that the contractors are complying and it's you know you you could foresee an event where a lot of the contractors that come to the space may be new and may be uh, unaware of all the requirements next slide please this has to be the last one then jim sure uh what well, can you go to the last slide so so uh oh, one back one and so, you know, obviously, if we can't work out some of these practical considerations and we keep going the, the direction we are, there's a question of whether all of these projects 
uh, that are slated to be funded, uh, you know, whether we can go forward with them, whether there'll be contractors to perform them. And, and if there are, should we expect to see an uptick in contract issues uh, you know, because of them being administered the same way, although we know that the, the labor shortage and the supply chain issues uh, are likely to continue to plague uh, contracts. So I think that's it. Jim, thank you very much. A great wrap up of practical experience. Uh, Susan, Dan, thank you for your expertise in this area. It just goes to show that uh, the competent counsel and uh, smart contractors will make all the difference. Uh, a big thanks to all our panel members for participating. I want to let me again thank our event sponsors uh, for their support on these next two slides here and on the next uh, for their support. We couldn't have done this program without them. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you at future sessions. Have a great day.